At the end of 2011, our national debt had reached 100% of our gross domestic product. That, that is frightening. But after World War II, our debt was 121% of GDP. Now, to be fair, we had something to show for it. We had won World War II, and the world was a very different place in 1945 than it is today. But the point is, is that we were tested. And how did we respond? Well, we invested in things that we believed would grow the economy. We invested in education, things like the GI Bill, which helped my mother-in-law, widowed at age 29, go to college. And in Pell Grants, which helped my wife Franny and her three sisters go to college. We invested in infrastructure. We built 40,000 miles of highways in the 1950s. We invested in innovation, and we won the space race, which in turn led to the creation of whole new, whole new industries, like personal computers and, and telecommunications. Those investments paid off, and our economy experienced three decades of incredible growth, growth that flowed to the top, to the middle, and to the bottom. Between 1947 and 1977, wages for the top fifth, the top fifth of workers grew by 99%. And wages for those on the in the bottom fifth, they rose by 116%. I know that's hard to believe. The wages of the bottom fifth grew more than those of the top fifth. But really, that happened. And even though we remained a nation in which many kids, like my wife Franny, grew up in poverty, we had enough to invest in a strong safety net that helped those kids, like Franny, and her sisters, and her brother, work their way into the middle class. We bounced back from World War II to build an economy with a middle class that was strong, secure, and accessible to almost everyone. And thanks in large part to the growth generated by that thriving middle class, we were able to lower our national debt to about 31% by 1981. So 121%. At the end of World War II to 1981 to about 31%. Since then, our economy has had some good times and some bad times. We've raised taxes and we have lowered taxes. We've had surpluses and we've had deficits. And as this chart shows, our debt relative to GDP has gone up and down. We've seen the results of a variety of approaches to the issues that we face today. Now, in the 1980 election, Ronald Reagan was elected on a platform that appealed to concerns that the government taxed too much and spent too much. And his approach was later called starving the beast. Here's how Here's how he explained it. Now, this is a quote. This is, this is Reagan, uh, President Reagan. There are always those who told us that taxes couldn't be cut until spending was reduced. Well, you know, we can lecture our children about extravagance until we run out of voice and breath. Or we can cure their extravagance by simply reducing their allowance, cutting taxes, cutting revenue to the government. When Reagan took office, he fulfilled his campaign promise and signed into law a huge tax cut. And on cue, we began to amass enormous deficits, almost immediately. In fact, President Reagan's budget director at the time, David Stockman, has explained that 1981 was when 
the era of large permanent deficits began. The deficits were so bad in his first year, in 1981, that President Reagan had to increase taxes in 1982. And again, in 1983, in fact, he ended up raising taxes 11 times, not because Ronald Reagan was a socialist. I, I, don't, I, I really don't think so. But rather because he couldn't ignore the arithmetic. Still, that first tax cut was so big that over the course of his presidency, over the course of his presidency, our national debt nearly tripled. It continued to grow rapidly during the administration of George H.W. Bush, and then he handed it off to President Clinton. And what he handed off was, at that point, the largest deficit in the history of our country. In President Clinton's 1993 deficit reduction package, he added two new tax rates, marginal tax rates at the top end, 36% for income above $180,000, 39.6% for income above $250,000. Republicans objected rather vehemently, arguing that asking the top 2% to pay a little more would send the economy into a recession, which of course would be detrimental to the goal of reducing the deficit. The bill passed without a single Republican vote in either house. But the Republicans' dire predictions turned out to be wrong, extremely wrong. Between 1993 and 2001, this country experienced an unprecedented expansion of our economy. We created 22.7 million net new jobs. We decreased the number of Americans in poverty to record lows. We increased the median household incomes, and we created more millionaires than we ever had before. And not only did President Clinton's deficit reduction plan reduce the deficit, it eliminated the deficit. President Clinton was able to hand off to President George W. Bush a record surplus. And in fact, in January of 2001, we were on track to completely pay off our national debt by the year 2011. However, as we know, President Bush chose a different course. Now, whether or not you agree with the two wars we entered into during his administration, the new entitlement program that we created, or the two tax cuts we passed, the fact of the matter is that we didn't pay for any of those things. They all went on our national credit card. And while the two tax cuts tilted toward those at the top did help some at the top do extremely well during the Bush administration. It's hard to say that the stuff we put on that credit card created the kind of durable, broad-based prosperity we saw in the 1990s or that we built in the 30 years after World War II, for that matter. It would be hard to say because when President Obama took office, from President Bush, the economy was hemorrhaging jobs at the rate of over 800,000 a month. And when the bill came for the Bush policies, we were staring at a projected $1.1 trillion deficit for 2009. That was the projected deficit that President Bush left for 
President Obama. So far, I've talked about President Reagan and his approach of cutting revenue in order to force the government to cut spending. We saw what happened. We couldn't or didn't cut enough spending to keep our budget in balance. And we had huge deficits, even when Reagan tried to backtrack and raise more revenue. I've talked about President Clinton and his approach of raising taxes on the top 2% in order to bring the budget into balance. And we saw what happened. The economy grew. And we generated a record surplus. I've talked about President Bush and his approach of cutting taxes and incurring large expenses without worrying about the ramifications on the deficit. And we saw what happened. Deficits ballooned. And when the economy crashed, it crashed hard. So what about President Obama? What has his approach been? Well, if you ask some people, including unfortunately many in this chamber, they tell you that President Obama's approach was to go on a massive spending spree. Well, it's just not true. Over his four budget years, federal spending is on track to rise from $3.52 trillion to $3.58 trillion, an annual increase of 0.4%. Now, you can hash these figures out in different ways, but here's a chart that comes from MarketWatch, a publication of Dow Jones, which also owns the Wall Street Journal. And that is Obama's increase in spending from 2010-13. This is Reagan from 2008 to 85. It uses, these are numbers from the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office and from the Office of Management and Budget. And you can see that the growth of federal spending is lower than it was under any of the presidents that I talked about. Indeed, the article that ran with this chart concludes that the growth of federal spending under President Obama is the lowest it's been since the Eisenhower administration during the wind down from the Korean War. But remember that besides a $1.1 trillion deficit, President Obama inherited an economy that in the month he took office lost over eight hundred thousand jobs. That was January. The next month, February of 2009, we lost about 700,000 jobs. But that's also the month in which we passed the Recovery Act. By the way, when the Recovery Act was passed in February of 2009, the unemployment rate was already above 8%. The Recovery Act, also known as a stimulus, is what people usually point to when pressed to explain why they think President Obama has increased spending. But the truth is that more than a third of the Recovery Act was tax cuts. The stimulus cut taxes for 95% of American families. Another third was fiscal aid to the states, which were feeling the same budget crunch as the federal government, but in most cases didn't have the option of running a deficit in, in tough years. Without the Recovery Act, imagine how many more teachers and firefighters and police officers would have had to been laid off. And imagine what that would have meant to our economy, never mind what it would have meant to our communities. But the third that gets the most attention was the third that went toward creating jobs. Now, now did it work? Well, there are a few ways to answer that question, but the answer is the same every time, yes, 
First, we could look at our chart. You can see that once the Recovery Act began to get it, be implemented, that we started losing less jobs, and then we started creating jobs. We've had 30 months, 30 straight months of job private, in the private sector of, of job growth. Now, second, you could ask economists. Most reputable economists, including... Would my, would my friend yield? Uh, certainly. Majority leader. Mr. President, Madam President, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have no more votes today. No more votes today. It's obvious to me what's going on. I've, I've been to a few of these rodeos. It's obvious there's a big stall taking place, so one of the senators who doesn't want to be in the debate tonight won't be in the debate. Well, he can't use the senator's excuse. There will be no more votes today. The senator from Minnesota. Thank you. That is, that is too bad. I, I was going over really what happened, reviewing what happened once the stimulus package had been passed in February when unemployment was over 8 percent. And you can see that as it started taking effect that we lost less and less jobs and then since have had 30 straight months of private sector job growth. And I said we could ask economists, most reputable economists, including those at the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, agreed the Recovery Act creators saved anywhere from 2.5 million to 3.5 million jobs. And in the words of Mark Zandi, Senator John McCain's own economic advisor in the 2008 presidential campaign, the federal policy response to the financial crisis, including the stimulus, quote, probably averted what could have been called depression the Great Depression 2.0. But we don't have to take Mark Zandi's words for it. We don't have to take the words of all the other reputable economists. We don't even have to take the Congressional Budget Office's words, word for it, although we here in Congress and CBO sort of exists for us to take their word for it. But we can just ask Jamie Cecile and Sheila. This, this is Jamie working on the Duluth lift bridge a couple of years back. Uh, this coming right here is Cecil. Uh, he's working on a highway extension project. Here, let's give Cecil his due. Uh, Cecil is working on a uh, highway extension project in Brooklyn Park in suburban Twin Cities. Then we have Sheila. This is her in front of her Bobcat working the night shift on an I-94 improvement project. These are people, these are people who are put back to work by the stimulus and despite claims by some that the only jobs created by the stimulus went to government bureaucrats. You will notice that Jamie, Cecil, and Sheila are not, in fact, government bureaucrats. Thankfully, we do not let government bureaucrats operate heavy machinery. So what can we say about President Obama's approach so far? Well, he slowed the growth of federal spending to its lowest level since Eisenhower. He's cut taxes, not just in the stimulus package, but many times during his first term to the tune of more than $850 billion. And when the economy was at its low point, he made investments that put people back to work in the short term and prevented things from getting even worse. Now, there was another road that we could have taken that of approach would have involved not just cutting spending, but gutting the government, 
and it definitely wouldn't have involved making investments to put people back to work. We'll never know whether that approach known as austerity would have gotten us results like the one reflected in, on the previous chart, but we do know what happened in countries where they tried this alternate approach. This is European countries that went the austerity route. This is GDP from 2008 to 2012. This would be where President Obama became president. And Europe, and we all were seeing a global meltdown. This is countries that did austerity in Europe. This is the United States. The evidence tells us that our way worked. Oh, President Obama's way worked and, and theirs did not. Of course, while we're better off than we were four years ago and better off than we would be if we had tried austerity instead of President Obama's approach, which, if you look at the growth of spending, was pretty close to austerity, but we're obviously still not where we want to be, either in terms of our economy or in terms of our deficit. So what's the right way going forward? First, let's talk about deficit reduction. It's clear to me that any solution that does not include both increased revenue and decreased spending simply isn't going to work. The hole's too big for us to tax our way out or to cut our way out. We have to do both. But the hole is, in fact, so big that we can't even just get out of it just by taxing and cutting. We have to grow our way out, too. That's why I think we need to invest in education and in infrastructure and in innovation. That means early childhood education, which has a return of investment in every study, quality early childhood education of $16 for every dollar spent, and in workforce training, and in roads and bridges, and rural broadband, and clean energy, and healthcare technology. I don't think that only the government can create jobs, I know that. But I know that only the government can make those critical investments that will help the private sector create jobs. And I know it works when we do. It worked after World War II. It worked under President Clinton. It worked in the Recovery Act. Those investments, however, cost money, and we won't be able to afford them unless we reduce our deficits. I think people who talk about cutting spending should say what spending they want to cut. I want to cut spending, so let me tell you what spending I want to cut. I want to cut the billions in subsidies that we give to oil companies that simply don't need them. I want to let Medicare negotiate for pharmaceuticals under Part D, just like the VA does, because prohibiting Medicare from doing so amounts to a subsidy for pharmaceutical companies, one that, again, they don't need. And I want to make cuts in our military budget because as the Comprehensive Defense Review, begun under Defense Secretary Gates and completed under Secretary Panetta, found we can make hundreds of billions of dollars in cuts to the defense budget without compromising our fundamental security and military interests. Of course, we can't only cut the things we think are easy calls to cut. We're going to have to cut some things that we don't want to cut. And speaking personally, I've already had to vote for some of those hard cuts, and it was not fun. 
but there simply aren't enough cuts to make. So it's clear to me that if we are going to protect our most vulnerable Americans, our children, the sick, the disabled, our seniors, and make the investments that will grow our middle class and our economy, we are going to have to raise revenue. And like President Reagan, but unlike some of today's Republicans, I know that you don't raise revenue by cutting taxes. That's why I support restoring the Bush tax cuts for the first $250,000 of income, but after that, allowing the top marginal rate to go back to where it was under President Clinton. I know that just like they did in 1993, people will argue that doing so will hurt the economy, but I'm equally confident that just like they were in 1993, they will be wrong. I know that we all come to the debate about our nation's challenges with different philosophies and different convictions, and I respect that many of my colleagues feel they'd be betraying their own political core by asking the wealthy to pay a little more or investing taxpayer dollars in job creation. I didn't feel great about all the cuts I've had to vote for over the last couple of years either. But I don't think we're going to get anywhere if we're so invested in following our own ideologies that we refuse to acknowledge the lessons of where we have been or the truth about where we are and where we are headed. We're not going to get anywhere if we can't agree that, yes, the government does have a role to play in helping the private sector create jobs. And no, you won't cut the deficit by cutting taxes. And yes, we're going to have to raise both revenues, raise revenues and reduce spending if we want to get a balanced budget. And no, asking the wealthy to pay a little more won't drive us back into a recession. We've debated these issues a lot this year and we haven't resolved the argument. Now we're going home and it's the American people's time. It's the American people who get to have their say. So I hope that over the next six weeks we lead them in a debate worthy of the challenges that we face a debate rooted in the facts and mindful of our history. And I hope that when we come back, we're ready to have that kind of worthy debate ourselves and then make the tough calls just as our constituents will in November. I wish my colleagues well over the recess, and I look forward to getting back to our important work when we return. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor.